Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome, fellow Earthlings. Happy Earth Day, 50th anniversary. So uh, thank you for taking a precious sliver of your time, your precious time to explore uh, Chinese medicine in relation to trauma, the emotions, and you'll see the earth, uh, the Chinese medicine view of, of health and wellness is earth-based. So um, know that this talk should not be considered as a substitute for a professional consultation. Uh, if you find yourself in acute crisis, call 911 or the suicide prevention hotline at 800-273-TALK or 273-8255. You can also text to uh, 83 TALK 8255. Hopefully, this talk will be centering, help you feel connected to your deepest wellspring of, of well being. If not, you're free to tune out or turn off this talk at any time. Uh, it will be recorded so you can tune back in at your leisure. A little bit about myself. I earned a Bachelor of the Arts from UCSC with majors in environmental studies and economics in 1984. Um, so I'm acutely aware of the unequal burden wrought by environmental destruction across society. Uh, the, the most polluting industries are located in the least affluent portions of society. And as the environment plays an important role in, in health and well-being and emotional health and well-being from a Chinese medicine perspective, we'll see how important that is as we go along. To quote Chief, Chief Seattle before I get started on the talk, will you teach your children what we have taught our children, that the earth is our mother, what befalls the earth befalls all the sons of the earth. This we know, the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. One thing we know, our God is also your God. The earth is precious to him, and to harm the earth is to heap contempt on its creator. So we'll open with a brief overview of PTSD and Chinese medical foundations, yin and yang and five element theory. Along the way, we'll look at PTSD and emotion more broadly, from a Chinese medical perspective with insights from modern scientific research. Many lifetimes of inquiry by some of the brightest minds and one of the antiquity's most advanced civilizations have been dedicated to Chinese medicine. And as you'll see, it's a quite holistic approach. It's much more than just acupuncture. Uh, five branches of Chinese medicine include acupuncture and we'll discuss all five briefly. Again, it'll be a brief talk in the context of thousands of years of knowledge on a very deep subject. I will refer to the classics. In the classics of Chinese medicine, it's said that 90% of med medicine is nursing and 10% treatment. Nursing here re re um, refers to Self-care, nursing practices would be exercise, diet, lifestyle. So I've been looking a lot at those practices as I've shifted my own practice to home. I'm here in my home office from which I've been seeing patients with telehealth. Again, Chinese medicine is much more than acupuncture and Chinese medicine providers have a lot more to offer than just acupuncture. Uh, my own experience with East Asian medicine and philosophy 
has, of course, been strongly influenced by my upbringing in the West. I love science, and I must admit that my practice of Chinese medicine is inspired by groundbreaking research that I come across that supports the age-old practices of classical Chinese medicine. And of course, this talk is necessarily infer informed by my personal experience with trauma. My first significant exposure to East Asian energetics came in the fourth grade as a student at the Sacramento Waldorf School. I remember being told that a Vietnamese Aikido master had been hired and that he could, quote, dodge bullets. Well, I never saw Sensei Tree dodge a bullet. Thank goodness. In fact, he seemed to move in slow motion. In demonstrations, he would throw much larger attackers with ease in a relaxed way. In Aikido, it said the attacker is the one who wants to roll. We learn to use the energy that comes our way. So my 10 year old body was stiff by comparison to Sensei Tree. And my understanding of true, true strength was shaken to its core. Since those early years, I've had the good fortune to study with several high-level martial artists, and it's become clear to me that the highest levels are attained by those steeped in the fundamentals from an early age. In the Warring States text, The Art of War, Sun Tzu writes, ultimate excellence lies not in winning every battle, but in defeating the enemy without even fighting. My teachers have often said that we should look to regain the openness and flexibility of the toddler. I've heard it said that the three most toxic words in the English language are be a man. True strength is fine in balance and balance comes from an open and alert, focused and relaxed countenance. The Tai Chi classics say that in action, a person should be like a cat stalking a mouse. We can also learn from observing the mouse and how it plays possum and freezes when its demise seems imminent. We have inborn neurological responses to threat that ser serve us, serve us well in times of threat. How quickly we can discharge the energy of the threat that when it gets lodged in our body is what's important to me and important in medicine. Matt Killingsworth uh, conducted an elegant study for his Harvard PhD dissertation. This was back in the late 90s, I think. So he put together a cell phone app that at random intervals sent three a three question survey to people with the app. The first question was, what are you doing? What were you doing before I interrupted you with a ping on your cell phone? Um, are you or were you fully focused on what you were doing? Is your mind in the action at hand? And the third question, rate your level of happiness. So since he did it across the cell phone, he was able to reach a huge pool of respondents and he clearly showed that when we pay attention we are happier western science reveals that the human brain forms approximately a million new connections per second during the first three years of life areas of the brain linked to judgment namely the prefrontal cortex aren't fully developed till our mid or late 20s and likewise, early life trauma has profound effects on the developing brain. Brain changes secondary to tr emotional adversity have been found to correlate with the nature of trauma. The amygdala and hippocampus are areas that have been shown to be particularly impacted by trauma. The amygdala is associated with anxiety and the hippocampus with memory. In PTSD, we're dealing with well, the, for the diagnosis of PTSD to be made, and PTSD is uh, uh, classified as an anxiety disorder, um, the memory is impacted. We're, we're 
tormented by memories either during wake or during sleep. According to Shunzi, a text from the third century BC, so 2300 year old text, emotions inherently have their beginnings in man's inborn nature. If these emotions are trimmed or stretched, broadened or narrowed, diminished or increased, if they're put into their proper category and fully conveyed, if they're brought to completion and made refined, if caused in root and branched, end and beginning to have nothing lacking obedience, and if joined in a pure, unmixed and perfect whole that can serve 10,000 generations, then they have become as rituals. None but the gentleman who has become obedient and has thoroughly cultivated himself through conscious effort is able to know how to do this. So this is speaking to that early understanding that while we seek to maintain the openness and flexibility of the toddler, that flexibility is impacted by emotion and the memories that that traumatic emotion can give us and it takes deep cultivation to step past those memories so i won't be providing a magic bullet but i'll be providing an overview of chinese medicine view of emotion and some simple practices that can help deal with the emotions of ptsd in the mid 90s robert felidi at kaiser and vincent anda at the cdc conducted a research uh, survey. They queried over 17,000 patients from Kaiser Hospital in the Bay Area, Kaiser Hospitals, multiple hospitals. So a group of Kaiser patients, so they were mostly middle-class people, and they asked about exposure to 10 different, what they called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. So they ranged from divorce, where they where their parents divorced when they were children, to incarceration of a parent, um, drug use or addiction by a parent, verbal or physical abuse. And then they they had access to the health records of those seventeen thousand some odd patients, and they correlated health outcomes with adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. 67% of the people uh, surveyed had at least one ACE, and one in eight had four or more. The higher the ACE score, the poorer the health. It's linked to a huge range of conditions from drug addiction to cancer, to heart disease and suicide. And I've been practicing traditional Chinese medicine for almost 20 years, and my early focus was on orthopedics. I did additional training in orthopedics, became a fellow of the American Academy of um, Physical Oriental Medicine. And what I saw across the years was that underlying much of what I see in my office is the energetic disruption of emotional trauma. And ACEs increase uh, your risk for PTSD. So a prior trauma increases the risk that a trauma will lodge deep enough to cause the symptoms that would be diagnosed as post-traumatic stress disorder. And that diagnosis only came about in the 70s, I believe, 60s or 70s. So the understanding is quickly evolving. My own parents had to shave my head as a toddler or as an infant so that an older sibling wouldn't pull my hair. And my sibling had been born, had been delivered by a resident at a Kaiser um, who had a heavy hand with the forceps. She suffered from a traumatic brain injury, which has led to a lifetime of mental illness. And traumatic brain injury is something commonly experienced by veterans as well. We've heard a lot about um, IEDs or improvised explosive devices. 
uh, Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center report shows that nearly 350,000 veterans have been diagnosed with TBI since 2000. Now we've probably all heard about CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which has uh, motivated a deep dive into the importance of many of our national platforms. Jason, can you turn your microphone off, please? Thank you. So the brain altering effects of repeated, repeated sub-concussive blows have been equated to those of major concussive blows, such as blast TBIs. And there's a lot of overlap in symptoms between PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Perhaps the most foundational theory in Chinese medicine is yin and yang. And etymologically, the term yin comes from the shady side of the mountain. Yang refers to the sunny side of the mountain. The warmth of the sun and its influence on the state of water from glacier to sea to cloud provides a potent example of the interplay of yin and yang. Yin is substance, yang is action. Nothing is purely yin or yang. Yin and yang define one another and in the extreme become one another. We see that in the symbol where there's white within the black and black within the white. The symbol is frozen. It should be in movement. It's a constant change. We're never fixed. Our, our bodies are constantly changing and hopefully changing in harmony with the seasons, with the sun and the moon and the seasons. Positive and neg negative, proton and electron, hot and cold, male and female. Yin and yang can be used to describe any polarity. We are charged beings. Western medical science measures the body's electricity with electroencephalograms or EEGs, which measure the uh, patterns of change across the brain and ECGs, also called EKGs, electrocardiograms, which measure the heartbeat's rhythmic fluctuations. Again, yin and yang are in constant flux. We maintain health with a balance of rest and activity. Stress is healthy when we're able to achieve positive results. For example, preparing to give a talk such as this is stressful. And completing it successfully, hopefully to the benefit of those who attend, is rewarding. So it's positive stress. We can think of our natural zone of resilience as the range of stressors we are able to face without lasting toxic activation. Resilience can be considered as the speed with which a person is able to return to a balanced state, return to harmony with the natural flow of their life. The trauma that leads to PTSD is so far out of a person's zone of resilience that it leads to chronic activation or collapse. And that chronic or activa activation or collapse, while it may serve us in a life-threatening si situation, if not addressed, will in the long run limit our ability to live life to the fullest. So a lot of people turn to drugs Medications prescribed or self-administered can be seen as extreme attempts to bring balance to being suffering from unhealthy levels of activation or collapse, yin or yang imbalance. Men with PTSD are five times more likely to have substance use disorder or SUD than the general population. While women are more than twice as likely as men to suffer from PTSD, Women with PTSD have been shown to be only 1.4% more likely than the general population to suffer from SUD. The five-phase theory builds on yin and yang. 
fire, earth, metal, water, and wood are the phases. Within each phase are a pair of organs, yin organs, which are reservoirs of the body's essential energy and are paired with yang organs, which are hollow and move food and fluids. The five phases are based on the energetics of the seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall, with the fifth season being classified as late summer. We call it Indian summer in this neck of the woods. Our typical energetics are ascribed to the organs. So when I speak about organs, I'm talking about a vastly different complex of, of emotions and, and energetics, taste, color, sense organs than is understood in the West. And these organs also include the organs as understood by their Western names. My partner and I were scheduled to attend the third of five seasonal workshops in mid-April, the wood workshop, when it was canceled due to the novel coronavirus. The teacher, Elaine Duncan, has drawn intriguing parallels between traditional five element theory and somatic experiencing, or SE, the work of the neurobiologist and longtime trauma therapist and author, Peter Levine. He wrote a book, uh, Waking the Tiger, Dr. Levine bases his work on observation of the way wild animals physically process trauma. We're young creatures on this earth and our neurobiology is quite similar to the gazelle when it escapes the pursuit of a cheetah on the African savanna. Dr. Levine found that the, the gazelle might go to a watering hole or somewhere safe under a tree promptly after evading threat and discharge that energy, shake. And um, unfortunately, as humans, we're told, don't cry, be a man. But if we block that energy inside ourselves, it can stunt our natural fluidity. If we were told, be a man and ignore the body's natural way of discharging the energy of trauma at any stage of the cycle, the cycles as equated with the seasons, then that energetic will be trapped in the body. The body keeps the score, to quote the title of a seminal book by a man, Bessel van der Kolk. So those, those energetic cycles of trauma and PTSD uh, Dr. Duncan calls awaken arousal for the body's initial sense of possible threat. So maybe a rustling in the in the grass or a, a stick on the ground. If we if we see that it's a stick and not a snake, then we quickly return to to comfort. Unless we have a history of of assault by snakes, then we might be stumbling for some time after. And awakened arousal is associated with the fall. The element in Chinese medicine is metal. It's at the bottom of the this, uh, graph that I'm showing in the slide. Uh, the color is white. It's shown gray here. And again, the metal element, which creates the water element. As water condenses on metal, fall leads to winter associated with the kidneys. And Dr. Duncan calls this signal threat. It's where the, we realize that the stick is indeed not, or that what we see as a snake is indeed a snake, not a stick. And water feeds wood, and wood is associated with the springtime in traditional Chinese medicine. Dr. Duncan talks about mobilize a response. It's that burst of energy that allows you to run from the snake if you have room to run or grab the snake by the neck quickly if you don't have room to run. So it's that burst of energy that allows an intense fight or flight response and associated with the wood in springtime. Wood feeds fire and the summer. Dr. Duncan would say co restore store coherence. So we've gotten away from the snake we're holding it by the neck, we can relax. So as it sounds, restore coherence is a, is a return towards 
balance. Once the threat has been avoided or overcome, it's associated with the element fire and again, summer. I mentioned the Indian summer, the fifth season in the Chinese calendar. It's associated with the earth element, the color is gold. And Dr. T Duncan talks about restore coherence or digest the gristle. It's where we, we gain wisdom from our experience, where we process the energy of the trauma so that we're better informed the next time, so that we can move through life's challenges with greater ease. So now I'll discuss each of the five phases and the energetics of their associated emotions one by one, starting with metal associated with the fall. First, a quote from the inner canon of the Yellow Emperor or the Wang Yi Nei Jing, which has widely been regarded as the foundational, the main foundational text of Chinese medicine dates back to around the time of Christ, the Warring States period. In the Yellow Emperor's classic, it said, treating illness is like building weapons when you've already gone to battle. It's much wiser to act preventively. So if we can go through the full rhythm, take any traumatic input and digest it, deal with it first, of course, if it's a snake, you're not gonna process it in the moment. Your body will do what it's trained to do. If you're a soldier, you will, you will act. Coming out of the trauma, we really need to allow that process to complete itself. So metal is the refined essence of earth. It rules the lungs in Chinese lexicon and associated with the lungs, the yin organ, the lungs is the large intestine. So inspiration and letting go. Among the 12 officials, the Chinese speak of 12 officials, there's five elements and in fire, there are two yin organs or two pairs of organs. So we get 12 organs and each is given a, metaphor, a metaphorical personification. So this isn't hard science, but it's a way of understanding energetics. And metal is regarded as the minister, like the emperor or empress or, or priestess, excuse me the priestess who aids the emperor in ruling the chi of the body. So we can see the impact of the lung physical organ on health and health disparity in the in the disparity of impacts of air pollution. Thank goodness, 50 years ago, we came together to celebrate this day and in 1970 signed the National Environmental Protection Act and the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Metal again feeds water. As metal condenses on water excuse me, water condenses on metal. Um, water is associated with winter. So fall leads to winter in the natural season, cycle of the seasons. The associated organs are the kidney and the urinary bladder. The kidney is said to be the reservoir of our deepest energetics. Our genetic inheritance, our essence resides in the kidneys. So the kidneys have both water and fire. Um, there's a, a core energy that comes from the kidneys and at which we feel fear. And the healthy relationship with fear allows us to move through fear inducing situations without losing our, our presence. The energy of fear can lead the chi to descend. So people will 
lose their bla bowel or bladder control in, in extremely terrifying situations. But those that have mastered fear can be the first to summer at, summit the world's highest mountain, as Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary did by climbing Everest. You have the energetics of the kidney to support you in facing fear-inducing situations. You can, the kidneys are also associated with the bones in Chinese medicine. We feel it in our bones. Known as the source of yin and yang, yin and ministerial fire. Water feeds wood. The season is the spring. And this is, this is the wood of, of the willow tree. Fresh spring growth that's flexible, able to bend in the wind and restore its natural shape. In Chinese medicine, wood is associated with the liver and gallbladder. The liver rules the eyes. We treat the liver for visual imbalance, but it also rules vision on a metaphoric sense. The liver official is known as the general. And in the classics, there's a lot of talk about um, how to lead by example. A really powerful general has deep vision to see what needs to be done to move ahead as a society, as an earth, for the good of all beings. Gandhi had a really beautiful expression of wood and anger. When he, when he said, I have learned through bitter experience that the one supreme lesson to conserve my anger and as heat conserved is transmuted energy into energy, even so our anger controlled can be transmuted into a power which can move the world. The one supreme lesson to conserve my anger and as heat conserved is transmuted into energy, even so our anger controlled can be transmuted into a power which can move the world. Gandhi was a wonderful leader. He had long-term vision. He also had such healthy fire that he was able to lead by example, by the sheer force of presence. He had no need to coerce. Wood feeds fire. Another quote by Gandhi, prayer is not asking, it is a longing of the soul. It is daily admission of one's weakness. It is better in prayer to have a heart without words than words without a heart. So the pure, we talk a lot in the West about an open heart. The energy of the heart in Chinese medicine corresponds. It allows unconditional love. It's associated with the fire element, the heart and small intestine. I spoke of another yin organ, which is called the heart protector, also known in the West as the pericardium and triple warmer. The direction is the South, the season is summer. Healthy fire allows us to give and receive love without attachment. Again, unconditional love. It gives us serenity and peace. Uh, Elaine Duncan says, restore coherence. We've overcome the emotional challenge. Now we can find coherence. When it's out of balance, we feel anxiety. While fear is associated with the kidneys, the heart suffers from startle, that that acute shock of, of a blast of fear, a loud noise. We see that in, in the stereotypical example of the veteran with PTSD who drops under the table at the sound of a car backfiring. And in Chinese medicine, PTSD is often diagnosed as heart shock. The heart is the emperor. 
It rules imperial fire, and it rules all the other organs. It allows spiritual unfolding. In the West, there's a great organization in the Santa Cruz Mountains, HeartMath. Um, I have a veteran who's attending who, who uses a heart rate variability training from HeartMath. And biofeedback can help us to regulate the heart. And Chinese medicine has five branches that all deal with all of these energetics to bring balance to the system. From fire, we get earth as ash feeds the earth. I grew up in Sacramento and in the fall, they would, in late summer, Indian summer and fall, they would slash and burn the rice paddy and uh, feed the, the earth with the ash. Earth element is associated with Indian summer, the center, it's the ground beneath us. It's the spleen is the in organ, though it also corresponds a lot with the pancreas as understood in Western physiology, anatomy and physiology, though the ancients didn't um, talk about the pancreas. And the yang organ paired with the spleen is the stomach. It's the official of food storage and assimilation. We are what we eat as long as we can absorb what we eat. It's associated with the emotions of trust, openness, and sincerity. In the West, we talk about the earth mama, that energy that can hold whatever comes their way. I think of the, the Indian uh, teacher, Amachi, who's known as the hugging saint. I haven't, I haven't experienced her embrace. I went to see her with a, a an adolescent uh, nephew one time. And unfortunately she was, she was ill. And I hear she suffers from a lot of physical ailments, but her spirit soars. From the Western perspective, we know, we know about the, we're learning rapidly recently learned about the importance of gut health for psychological health, about the enteric nervous system and how the gut is the source of more serotonin than the brain. Elaine Duncan again talks about digesting the gristle, allowing the energetic of trauma to become a part of us so that we can move smoothly through the cycles of the next trauma. And the energy of the earth, the spleen is associated with the muscles of the body. In uh, Chinese medicine, diabetes is called wasting and thirsting. So we can see that diabetes has a strong dietary connection. So that's a, the five elements in a, in a nutshell, yin and yang and the five elements. Next, we'll talk about the five branches of Chinese medicine that, come, that lend the name to the school. So the five branches are, are the treatment modalities. Massage is one of them and Chinese medical massage Traditionally, is a very high-level art. Chiropractic comes out of, of Tui Na, or Chinese medical massage. A Tui Na master would have skill at setting bones and would know how to use herbal medicine to speed the healing of bones, both internal and topically. A lot of this sort of medicine comes from the martial arts. And I'll speak more about that in a minute. Western medicine has been slow to accept the power of massage. I was treating my father with some um, massage in the hospital when he was suffering from an internal organ injury years ago. And he was so blown away by the effectiveness of it that he told his doctor, you should have my son train your staff. 
they could do so, so much good. And the doctor's reply was, massage doesn't help. It may be relaxing, but it doesn't help. <laughs> I thought that was such an oxymoronic response. Relaxation is key so that we can deal appropriately with stress. Acupuncture is the most well-known branch, proven to work on animals. Our dog, uh, Bodhi, has had great response to acupuncture, and he's pretty chill, both in spite of and because of it. Um, about a year ago, I, I defended a doctoral paper on acupuncture and neuroplasticity in the treatment of depression. We won't talk a lot about acupuncture. It's not something that the Chinese would consider nursing. You can't uh, needle yourself, though you might consult with an acupuncturist about where to place uh, seeds, if you're familiar with ear seeds, on acupuncture points for self-care. Um, so anyways, I... I wrote a paper on acupuncture and neuroplasticity in the, in the treatment of depression. One of the studies that I reviewed took an fMRI of zones of the brain, uh, regions associated with depression called the default mode network. And they screened in section A, the, the top of this slide, they, they took a MRI image of 17 people who scored really low on a depression rating scale, a questionnaire. So they were very positive at the time, very happy. And then they also scanned people with major depressive disorder, MDD, that's level, that's B slide or the middle three images. That's the MRI of showing reduced activation of the default mode network among people with major depressive disorder. Immediately after the scan of the depressed people, they treated the depressed people with a single needle. Well, actually they used two because they ran a one Hertz current through uh, a needle at the top of the head, at the crown of the head, that's commonly used to brighten the mind in Chinese parlance. And then immediately following 20 minutes of stimulation of that needle, they re scanned the brains of the depressed 17 and, and that image is shown or it's an amalgamation of the scans of the 17 people shown in the bottom of this slide. You can see how just one needle for 20 minutes brought the brain electrical activity or blood flow, which is basically electrical activity, into greater concordance with that of healthy subjects, people who, who had a positive frame of mind. So with Chinese medicine, we don't need to rehash trauma. We can find balance through the underlying energetics. One of the branches is diet. Diet and lifestyle, actually. And we're finding that a lot of mental illness can be, can be ameliorated with dietary change and paying attention to the gut microbiome is huge in diet. Chinese, in Chinese medicine, there's an herbal prescription that contains um, ferments, so a strong influence on fermented foods. In Chinese medicine, we try to eat in harmony with the seasons. We try to eat by color, flavor, and temperature of the food. So the metal element is associated with the spicy flavor water, salty, wood, sour, fire, bitter, earth, sweet. Too much of any flavor 
will lead to imbalance, but tweaking the flavors can help to bring balance. Last year, I had a patient come in who I'd worked hard to adjust his, his diet. And he had a very stressful life. He was a very, very busy guy. And, and um, he had a lot of health issues. But we had, we had regulated his mood with diet. And he came in after some absence. Uh, I fit him in quickly because he, he called saying that he was suffering from severe anxiety. And the morning he came to see me, he had seen his Western provider who had prescribed an anti-anxiety medication. And while I will never counsel a person to get off or to discontinue prescription meds without um, the supervision of the prescribing physician, I did see clearly that he was in a very acute process. And I asked him point blank right off, what did you eat before, before you experienced this anxiety? And he had binged on pizza and beer. So he was willing to wait a little while before starting the anti-anxiety medications. And with dietary adjustment, he was able to avoid those medications. So diet, very important branch of the medicine. And just as foods are given flavors and energetics, so are herbs. And herbal medicine will turn to when food isn't strong enough. Herbs and foods as well are said to enter particular organ systems. So they have, their dynamic can be, can be focused in, into organ systems, depending on the herbs that we add into the, to the formulas. And at Five Branches University, we have a pharmacy with over 350 different herbs that we can tailor to a person's distinct imbalance at the time they come to see us. And we can modify, we can tweak gradually to, to move with their energetics as they come into balance. There's a saying in the classics, same disease, different treatment. Different disease, same treatment. So just because you have a headache doesn't mean you have a fire condition. Fire does rise to the head and top of the head might have a, would, would point more likely to a fire condition, but it could be a damp condition, it might feel like a damp towel wrapped around your head. So herbal medicine, very powerful. Okay, so I'm showing a flyer from the VA advertising Tai Chi classes before the stay in place order. I was teaching at the Santa Cruz Vet Center off of Capitol Avenue, uh, off of Capitol Avenue, 41st Avenue and Jade. Um, hopefully we'll get that going before too long. In the meantime, if you're interested in Tai Chi and Qigong, reach out to me as I'm gonna try to put together, if you're a veteran, again, this is for veterans only. Um, I'm gonna try and put together some online classes. Tai Chi Chuan translates as supreme ultimate fist. So Tai Tai in Chinese is wife, supreme, supreme. Qi, this isn't the Qi of, of body energy. This is the ultimate. And Chuan means fist. So Tai Chi Chuan is a martial art that emphasizes relaxation in the face of stress. Relaxed alertness, the attitude of a cat stalking a mouse. It's not the martial art of karate. Though karate can develop those skills too. I have nothing against that. And for kids with a lot of yang energy, karate and taekwondo can be just what the doctor ordered. Qigong translates as 
breath. So that's that energetic. The symbol for qi in Chinese medicine looks like steam coming off a pot of cooking rice. The steam could connotate breath and the rice, the energy we get from food. So qigong is breath work. Gong fu or kung fu refers to the skill. Fu would be skill, skill acquired through work or practice. Whatever you put your mind and time to, you will get good at. So talking about breath from the Western perspective, it's been shown that diaphragmatic breathing or singing or chanting can uh, support our nervous system. There's a lot of interest in the, the vagus nerve in the West. And there are Qigong practices that can stimulate the brain stem. And I'm making conjecture now. There haven't been strong scientific studies on this, but that's a whole rabbit hole. I could talk for hours about any of these subjects, but, but let's um, move on. Okay, gotta go here. Uh -oh. There we go. I referred earlier to Guanzi, the seventh century political and philosophical text. To quote chapter 35 from chapter 35. I wish to moderate the hotness of my temperament so that my words will be quietly spoken. However, the concealment of an overly strong temperament leads to excitability. The concealment of an overly weak temperament leads to depression. How can I control this? When the power of your inner self is in a period of decline, see which of the five phases is in position. Think deeply about its positive aspects and change will follow. Having been revitalized, the mind's power to overcome adversity will deal with your temperament. This is because one possesses a temperament that can wax or wane, be happy or sad. So this is showing that early seventh century recognition that emotion could get locked in the body. And by finding harmony with the seasons, our body can learn to let the energy of emotion move more fluidly through us. From chapter 38 of the same text, through the movement of the seasons, come to know your inner reality. Through the rich earth, find sustenance for your life. Can you be like the wind and waves, desiring only what is appropriate to the circumstances? I'll close with a quote from FDR. A nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. Forests are the lungs of our land, purifying the air and giving fresh strength to our people. So I heard somebody speaking recently about cultural appropriation. And that question comes up around Chinese medicine, but hopefully the way I've presented today gives you a sense that the blood that runs through the Chinese is basically the same as the blood that runs through you, the blood that runs through the cheetah and the gazelle. And we're all influenced by the cycles, the natural cycles of this precious earth that we share. So maybe Sean can call the questions 
and present first the most popular of the questions so that those who have to leave um, will be more likely to get their questions answered. Does that yeah, work, Sean? Could, um, yes, yes. And if you could put your uh, questions in the chat function, um, okay, let me, I will let me see collect them. In. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, right. So, so if you have a question, type it in the chat section. All right. Well, um, it doesn't seem anyone has any questions. Um, I think the group is small enough that if anyone does yeah. have one, they can shout it out. Yeah. Okay. Good. I take that as a compliment. Everything was perfectly clear. Um, I, I guess one question would just be, um, like, what are some practical tips that someone could do who's not working with like a practitioner, but um, might be able to do to improve their lifestyle. Exercise, aerobic and what's known as internal exercise. I think yoga is wonderful. Meditative, relaxed, extended postures. And from a Western perspective, Oxygen and sugar are the brain's main food. So aerobic exercise pumps the heart and, and thus pumps oxygen to the brain. Sugar is the brain's food as well, but the brain loves a steady stream of sugar, not the spike that you get from eating even sweet fruit like a banana will spike your blood sugar. So you, if you eat a banana, have it with some, some fats or some protein to, to moderate that influence of the sugars. A lot of um, brilliant scientists these days are, are nicknaming Alzheimer's disease type three diabetes because the influence of, of blood sugar dysregulation on the brain, on the mind, according to Western medicine is very strong. So diet, exercise, appropriate relaxation, and sleep, crucial to restore the yin. In this time where, where many of us are staying at home, we have the opportunity to slow down a little. Life can get so hectic. And one of the main tips that I'll give my, my patients around sleep is if you're having trouble sleeping, avoiding screen time for an hour before your head hits the pillow, dimming the lights. The natural cycle is the light goes red at sunset and your devices probably have a blue light blocker that you can turn on, have it come on after sunset. And so no exposure to bright lights and try and get to bed by 10 or 11 o'clock in Chinese in the classics, it says the blood returns to the liver for nourishment when we're asleep. And the liver and its associated gallbladder are associated with the hours of 11 p.m. till 3 a.m. 3 to 5 a.m. is the time of the lung. It's a time of the, the priest or priestess when we can really center ourselves, prepare for the, for the new day. It's a great time to practice those internal arts early in the morning, not necessarily three o'clock. I'm not advocating that you get up at three. Just when you get up, do some quiet centering facing the east, facing the rising sun. 
sleep, my diet, exercise. Now, those are a few. Other questions? Let me think of some. I was thinking of sharing some Qigong practices with you, but it seems a little abbreviated. Um, yeah, the workshop was on trauma. I think I've, I've gone pretty deeply into the Chinese medicine understanding of trauma as an energetic insult held in the body here on Earth Day when we're seeing the, the impacts of our species on this planet. Yeah, but I could go, I could go, I could go off on that one. Let's see, question. Great presentation. Thank you, David.